My education had received as much attention from my parents as their situation in a new country would admit. I had been at school some, where I learned to read in a book that was about half as large as a Bible, and in the Bible I had read a little. I had also learned the Catechism, which I used frequently to repeat to my parents, and every night before I went to bed, I was obliged to stand up before my mother and repeat some words that I suppose was a prayer. My reading, Catechism and prayers, I have long since forgotten. Though for a number of the first years that I lived with the Indians, I repeated the prayers as often as I had an opportunity. After the Revolutionary War, I remembered the names of some of the letters when I saw them, but have never read a word since I was taken prisoner. It is but a few years since a missionary kindly gave me a Bible, which I am very fond of hearing my neighbours read to me, and should be pleased to learn to read it myself, but my sight has been for a number of years so dim that I have not been able to distinguish one letter from another. As I before observed, I got home with the horse very early in the morning, where I found a man that lived in our neighbourhood, and his sister-in-law who had three children, one son and two daughters. I soon learned that they had come there to live a short time, but for what purpose I cannot say. The woman's husband, however, was at that time in Washington's army fighting for his country, and as her brother-in-law had a house she had lived with him in his absence, their names I have forgotten. Immediately after I got home, the man took the horse to go to his house after a bag of grain, and took his gun in his hand for the purpose of killing game, if he should chance to see any. Our family, as usual, was busily employed about their common business. Father was shaving an axe helve at the side of the house. Mother was making preparations for breakfast. My two oldest brothers were at work near the barn, and the little ones, with myself and the woman and her three children, were in the house. Breakfast was not yet ready when we were alarmed by the discharge of a number of guns. That seemed to be near. Mother and the women before mentioned almost fainted at the report, and everyone trembled with fear. On opening the door, the man and horse lay dead near the house, having just been shot by the Indians. I was afterwards informed that the Indians discovered him at his own house with his gun, and pursued him to father's, where they shot him as I have related. They first secured my father, and then rushed into the house, and without the least resistance made prisoners of my mother, Robert, Matthew, Betsy, the woman and her three children, and myself, and then commenced plundering. My two brothers, Thomas and John, being at the barn, escaped and went to Virginia, where my grandfather Irwin then lived, as I was informed by a Mr. Fields, who was at my house about the close of the Revolutionary War. The party that took us consisted of six Indians and four Frenchmen, who immediately commenced plundering, as I just observed, and took what they considered most valuable, consisting principally of bread, meal and meat. Having taken as much provision as they could carry, they set out with their prisoners in great haste for fear of detection, and soon entered the woods. On our march that day, an Indian went behind us with a whip, with which he frequently lashed the children to make them keep up. In this manner we travelled till dark without a mouthful of food or a drop of water, although we had not eaten since the night before. Whenever the little children cried for water, the Indians would make them drink urine or go thirsty. At night they encamped in the woods without fire and without shelter, where we were watched with the greatest vigilance. Extremely fatigued and very hungry, we were compelled to lie upon the ground, supperless and without a drop of water to satisfy the cravings of our appetites. As in the daytime, so the little ones were made to drink urine in the night if they cried for water. Fatigue alone brought us a little sleep for the refreshment of our weary limbs, and at the dawn of day, we were again started on our march in the same order that we had proceeded on the day before. About sunrise we were halted, and the Indians gave us a full breakfast of provision that they had brought from my father's house. Each of us being very hungry, partook of this bounty of the Indians, except father, who was so much overcome with his situation, so much exhausted by anxiety and grief, that silent despair seemed fastened upon his countenance, and he could not be prevailed upon to refresh his sinking nature by the use of a morsel of food. Our repast being finished, we again resumed our march, and before noon passed a small fort that I heard my father say was called Fort Kanagojiga. That was the only time that I heard him speak from the time we were taken till we were finally separated the following night.
Towards evening we arrived at the border of a dark and dismal swamp, which was covered with small hemlocks, or some other evergreen and other bushes into which we were conducted, and having gone a short distance we stopped to encamp for the night. Here we had some bread and meat for supper, but the dreariness of our situation, together with the uncertainty under which we all laboured as to our future destiny, almost deprived us of the sense of hunger and destroyed our relish for food. Mother, from the time we were taken, had manifested a great degree of fortitude and encouraged us to support our troubles without complaining, and by her conversation seemed to make the distance and time shorter and the way more smooth. But father lost all his ambition in the beginning of our trouble, and continued apparently lost to every care, absorbed in melancholy. Here, as before, she insisted on the necessity of our eating, and we obeyed her, but it was done with heavy hearts. As soon as I had finished my supper, an Indian took off my shoes and stockings and put a pair of moccasins on my feet, which my mother observed, and believing that they would spare my life, even if they should destroy the other captives, addressed me as near as I can remember in the following words. My dear little Mary, I fear that the time has arrived when we must be parted forever. Your life, my child, I think will be spared, but we shall probably be tomahawked here in this lonesome place by the Indians. Oh, how can I part with you, my darling? What will become of my sweet little Mary? Oh, how can I think of your being continued in captivity without a hope of your being rescued? Oh, that death had snatched you from my embraces in your infancy. The pain of parting then would have been pleasing to what it now is, and I should have seen the end of your troubles. Alas, my dear, my heart bleeds at the thoughts of what awaits you. But if you leave us, remember, my child, your own name and the name of your father and mother. Be careful and not forget your English tongue. If you shall have an opportunity to get away from the Indians, don't try to escape, for if you do, they will find and destroy you. Don't forget, my little daughter, the prayers that I have learned you. Say them often. Be a good child, and God will bless you. May God bless you, my child, and make you comfortable and happy. During this time the Indians stripped the shoes and stockings from the little boy that belonged to the woman who was taken with us, and put moccasins on his feet, as they had done before on mine. I was crying. An Indian took the little boy and myself by the hand to lead us off from the company, when my mother exclaimed, don't cry, Mary. Don't cry, my child. God will bless you. Farewell. Farewell. The Indian led us some distance into the bushes or woods, and there lay down with us to spend the night. The recollection of parting with my tender mother kept me awake, while the tears constantly flowed from my eyes. A number of times in the night the little boy begged of me earnestly to run away with him and get clear of the Indians, but remembering the advice I had so lately received, and knowing the dangers to which we should be exposed, in travelling without a path and without a guide, through a wilderness unknown to us, I told him that I would not go, and persuaded him to lie still till morning. Early the next morning, the Indians and Frenchmen that we had left the night before came to us, but our friends were left behind. It is impossible for anyone to form a correct idea of what my feelings were at the sight of those savages, whom I supposed had murdered my parents and brothers, sister and friends, and left them in the swamp to be devoured by wild beasts. But what could I do? A poor little defenceless girl, without the power or means of escaping, without a home to go to, even if I could be liberated, without a knowledge of the direction or distance to my former place of residence, and without a living friend to whom to fly for protection, I felt a kind of horror, anxiety, and dread that to me seemed insupportable. I durst not cry, I durst not complain, and to inquire of them the fate of my friends, even if I could have mustered resolution, was beyond my ability, as I could not speak their language, nor they understand mine. My only relief was in silent, stifled sobs. My suspicions as to the fate of my parents proved too true, for soon after I left them they were killed and scalped, together with Robert, Matthew, Betsy, and the woman and her two children, and mangled in the most shocking manner. Having given the little boy and myself some bread and meat for breakfast, they led us on as fast as we could travel, and one of them went behind and with a long staff, picked up all the grass and weeds that we trailed down by going over them. By taking that precaution they avoided detection, for each weed was so nicely placed in its natural position that no one would have suspected that we had passed that way. 
It is the custom of Indians when scouting or on private expeditions to step carefully and where no impression of their feet can be left, shunning wet or muddy ground. They seldom take hold of a bush or limb and never break one. And by observing those precautions and that of setting up the weeds and grass which they necessarily lop, they completely elude the sagacity of their pursuers and escape that punishment which they are conscious they merit from the hand of justice. After a hard day's march we encamped in a thicket where the Indians made a shelter of boughs and then built a good fire to warm and dry our benumbed limbs and clothing, for it had rained some through the day. Here we were again fed as before. When the Indians had finished their supper, they took from their baggage a number of scalps and went about preparing them for the market, or to keep without spoiling, by straining them over small hoops which they prepared for that purpose, and then drying and scraping them by the fire. Having put the scalps, yet wet and bloody, upon the hoops and stretched them to their full extent, they held them to the fire till they were partly dried, and then with their knives commenced scraping off the flesh. And in that way they continued to work, alternately drying and scraping them, till they were dry and clean. That being done, they combed the hair in the neatest manner, and then painted it and the edges of the scalps yet on the hoops, red. Those scalps I knew at the time must have been taken from our family by the colour of the hair. My mother's hair was red, and I could easily distinguish my father's and the children's from each other. That sight was most appalling. Yet I was obliged to endure it without complaining. In the course of the night they made me to understand that they should not have killed the family if the whites had not pursued them. Mr. Fields, whom I have before mentioned, informed me that, at the time we were taken, he lived in the vicinity of my father, and that on hearing of our captivity, the whole neighbourhood turned out in pursuit of the enemy, and to deliver us if possible. But that their efforts were unavailing. They, however, pursued us to the dark swamp, where they found my father, his family and companions, stripped and mangled in the most inhuman manner, that from thence the march of the cruel monsters could not be traced in any direction, and that they returned to their homes with the melancholy tidings of our misfortunes, supposing that we had all shared in the massacre. The next morning we went on, the Indian going behind us and setting up the weeds as on the day before. At night we encamped on the ground in the open air, without a shelter or fire. In the morning we again set out early, and travelled as on the two former days, though the weather was extremely uncomfortable, from the continual falling of rain and snow. At night the snow fell fast, and the Indians built a shelter of boughs, and a fire, where we rested tolerably dry through that and the two succeeding nights. When we stopped, and before the fire was kindled, I was so much fatigued from running, and so far benumbed by the wet and cold, that I expected that I must fail and die before I could get warm and comfortable. The fire, however, soon restored the circulation, and after I had taken my supper I felt so that I rested well through the night. On account of the storm, we were two days at that place. On one of those days, a party consisting of six Indians who had been to the frontier settlements came to where we were and brought with them one prisoner, a young white man who was very tired and dejected. His name I have forgotten. Misery certainly loves company. I was extremely glad to see him, though I knew from his appearance that his situation was as deplorable as mine and that he could afford me no kind of assistance. In the afternoon the Indians killed a deer which they dressed and then roasted it whole, which made them a full meal. We were each allowed a share of their venison and some bread, so that we made a good meal also. Having spent three nights and two days at that place, and the storm having ceased early in the morning, the whole company, consisting of twelve Indians, four Frenchmen, the young man, the little boy and myself, moved on at a moderate pace without an Indian behind us to deceive our pursuers. In the afternoon we came in sight of Fort Pitt, as it is now called, where we were halted while the Indians performed some customs upon their prisoners which they deemed necessary. That fort was then occupied by the French and Indians, and was called Fort Duquesne. It stood at the junction of the Monongahela, which is said to signify, in some of the Indian languages, the falling in banks, and the Allegheny Rivers, where the Ohio River begins to take its name. The word Ohio signifies bloody. At the place where we halted, the Indians combed the hair of the young man, the boy, and myself, and then painted our faces and hair red, 
in the finest Indian style. We were then conducted into the fort where we received a little bread and were then shut up and left to tarry alone through the night.'